Oh, good morning. Welcome back to uh, Planet Doug. As you might see around me, I'm walking beside the, uh, the Klang River, which means I'm still here in Kuala Lumpur. I haven't had the uh, GoPro out for a while for reasons that I'll explain in a minute. So you can think of this as kind of an update video for anyone that's uh, keeping track of where I might be and what I might be doing. But yeah, I'm still here in uh, Kuala Lumpur. It's early in the morning, just after eight o'clock, not so early. And I'm heading out for some breakfast. And I thought I'd uh, show the little breakfast spot that I'm going to. It's a little alleyway coffee shop that I went to with uh, Daryl from Wander Eats uh, last week, actually. And I really like the place. It's very near the hostel where I used to stay here in Kuala Lumpur for a long time. So I was aware of this place in the alleyway. I think it's called, on Google Maps, I think they call it Wang Mi Coffee Stall. I don't know what the, like the local name for it is or if there's a sign that says Wang Mi, but you'll see what it looks like in a minute. But it's right in the alley behind the hostel where I used to stay, near the famous uh, a Hindu temple in Chinatown. I'll show you all that in a minute. But I knew it was there in the alleyway because I, I went past it all the time. But until last week with Daryl, I'd uh, never actually eaten there before. I didn't even know they served food. I thought they just uh, served coffee or something like that. But uh, yeah, they serve uh, coffee, drinks, and food. So. Yeah, it's really my kind of place. So I'm heading there for breakfast, and I thought I'd bring, I'd break out the GoPro and tell a little bit of a, a story about what's been going on. And I'm here back at my old stomping grounds. This is the uh, Passar Seni uh, LRT station. Just uh, decided to walk in this direction to get to this little alleyway uh, coffee shop. And there's Vinny Jaya. Banana leaf uh, curry house across the street. I used to eat there all the time. My old hostel right over here. I just walked down here from my hotel near Masjid Jamak, and uh, it's kind of crazy how busy it is in the morning. The uh, commuter rush. I can get to this coffee stall a quicker route just down a little alley right there but I thought I'd go this way because it will uh, orient you better as to where this place is because I want to go by the uh, Hindu temple and uh, yeah the Hindu temple is a, a big landmark here in Chinatown and I wanted to walk past it to show the location of this coffee shop you know relative to the temple but also to show what the temple looks like because for quite a few months it was closed for uh, painting. For uh, like, I don't think they renovated, like I don't think they built new buildings or, or added to the temple, but they uh, covered the whole temple in tarps and scaffolding for a few months. And just recently I noticed that the scaffolding and tarps had been removed and you can see the new, uh, the new paint job, very, very colorful. So it's, uh, it's open again, basically is what I'm saying. I noticed online, if you go to you know, Google Maps and look at all the reviews from visitors, because it's a very popular spot for foreigners to visit here in uh, Kuala Lumpur. It's on everyone's list of places they should check out, the very famous temple. And there are a lot of disappointed people for the last I don't know, six months or so, because they come here to tick it off their list and say they saw the temple and take a picture of it, and they found it was uh, completely covered in tarps. But now, the tarps have been removed. Some of the scaffolding is still up. There it is. I'm getting close to it right now. So that's it. That's how it looks now. Big change 
from before. Looks very nice, very colorful. As I said, some of the, the scaffolding on the front is still there, but the tarps have been removed to show all the work that they've done. I like that orange. It's not a vibrant orange, you know, it's, it's just a yeah, very nice uh, brownish orange. And I don't know if the temple is uh, open to visitors yet or not. It may not be. You can see the main entrance is still covered by a tarp, though a side entrance is open. But anyway, that is uh, what it looks like now. And maybe we can, I've, I haven't said the name of it just because I always forget. There we are, okay. the. Uh, Mother Goddess, the Sri Maha Mariamman Temple. And you find these uh, Mariamman temples in uh, cities all around the world. Founded in 1873 as a private family shrine by prominent businessman K. Tambusami Pillai. So, uh, yeah, so it's got a history going all the way back to 1873. I don't think I even realized it was uh, that old. But yeah, here's the, uh, the new color scheme. So if you find this temple, then you can turn down this alleyway. And this has changed uh, quite a bit as well. It's never been a very attractive alleyway. I mean, you can even see now, because of all the construction, there's still a lot of uh, junk lying around. But they've also painted the walls now. So you can see all this uh, colorful painting. Purple peacock. So they're redoing the uh, alleyway as well at the same time that they painted the uh, the temple itself. And then right here, this alleyway is where we get to uh, my breakfast spot. Yeah, I know this area quite well. And uh, this was like a really, my, my hostel is right here, this roof structure. So that's part of the hostel where I, where I used to stay, or maybe up there? No, right here. Yeah, I get confused sometimes. I don't even know if the hostel is open at all right now. But uh, yeah, this, this was never painted before, but it looks quite nice now. And these are the, the tables for this little uh, coffee shop. According to Google Maps right now is as busy as it gets. So this would be the busy period. But I see one table open, or a couple tables actually. Good morning. How are you? What is the name of your place here? Uh, three, oh my. Your, your, your restaurant. Oh, right there, Wang Mi. Oh, it is. I saw it on Google Maps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wang Mi coffee stall. Okay. So I was just talking to the owner for a minute or two, and um, it is called Wang Mi Coffee Stall. And uh, I think they've been here for 20 or 30 years that they've been operating. It's only open in the morning, so it's like a morning breakfast uh, place. So that, that's when you'd want to come here. And uh, they have a small menu here on the outside, which is very handy. You can see all the items you can get here. Nice photographs with uh, the prices, and then they also sell uh, you know, coffee, tea, and cham. So I ordered lu mi kai, which I think is it's rice and char xiao bao. I ordered two of those, siu mai, and uh, some cham. And there at the back, you can see the name Wang Mi uh, Coffee Stall. And he has all the food in drawers here, all hot and ready to go. Which is great. I don't know how, is it? Oh, gas. Okay, so he's got a uh, heater down below there. Keeps everything going. 
Everything here is uh, pre-made, as I said, and is, is hot in the, in, the, um, in the cabinet there, ready to go. So you get your food uh, very quickly. So here is what I have. And then this is the, uh, I think, rice with uh, mushrooms. I'll, I'll open that in a minute. Then I ordered uh, cham as well. So these are all the, uh, the tables here in the alleyway. And that's it right there. Wong Mi uh, coffee stall. Uh, thank you. All right. Look at that. Cham. And I, I got the large. And cham, I believe, is this kind of part coffee, part tea. So you get, you know, get the flavors of a flavors of both. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, I prefer it over the uh, coffee. As a smoother flavor, I guess it gets, uh, because of the tea, it, uh, it isn't quite as bitter as uh, the coffee could sometimes be. So I like that a lot. To be honest, this is the this is the dish that brought me back when I was here with Daryl. He basically ordered everything because I, <laughs> I like it when uh, when someone takes over ordering because I you know even if I order I'll always order the wrong thing. I always sit in the worst at the worst table and I order the wrong food. It's just what I do. It's one of my superpowers. So. When I go out for breakfast with Daryl, it's always nice when he just orders food and I, you know, I'll enjoy whatever it is I get, so I'm not that worried about it. And um, he, I think when I got it with Daryl, it, maybe it came on a plate, I'm not sure. Ah, okay. Ah, yeah, that's exactly what it looked like when I was here with Daryl. And um, yeah, it's rice, sticky rice with um, mushrooms on the top and uh, something special about the flavoring let's dive in uh, nice a little bit sweet a little bit of a uh, sweet flavor When I was here with Daryl last week, of course, um, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to the food because I hadn't seen Daryl for quite a while. He'd got off on trips to various places, family, family reunions and all kinds of things. And then um, whenever I see Daryl again after some time has passed, I just talk his ear off. I have so many things to talk about all the time. So I was so busy talking, maybe I didn't pay as much attention to the food as I could have, but I remembered how much I liked it. It was really, really good. And I love the uh, casual uh, atmosphere here. Mm. Also looks really, really good. As always, I have such a funny relationship with, with food and in general and breakfast in particular because I often don't have breakfast at all I don't feel hungry but <laughs> as soon as I get to a place if I make the effort to come to a place like this first thing in the morning and I sit down I start eating and I realize I'm starving so uh, I, <laughs> I don't realize how hungry I am until I actually have uh, food and drink in front of me Mm. Mm. And the buns really really good you can see filled with a uh, tasty sauce like filling stuffed you know really tasty filling on the inside Mm. So that's it uh, for breakfast. You can see the uh, tables behind me there. 
and my meal, to be honest, I ordered more food than a normal person would need for breakfast, I think. Everything I had came to uh, just about 15 ringgit. Yeah, 15 ringgit or something like that. So, yeah. One thing though, maybe, I, as I said, I have a habit of ordering all the wrong things. What I had there for breakfast, I don't think I could have that every day as a breakfast because it was so sweet. Everything I ordered, I think even the, the sticky rice, the, uh, you know, the buns, everything had a lot of sugar in it. So right now I just have an overwhelming feeling of my mouth being full of sugar. And uh, every, it, it had kind of a, felt like I was having candy for breakfast. It had that much sugar in it. And um, yeah, so I, I couldn't have something like that every day, I don't think. But it was good. Yeah, it was very good. And uh, yeah, some more of the, the painting down this uh, alleyway. It's really nice that, they, uh, that they've done this. Though uh, one other, uh, maybe one other thing to think about if you wanted to come here to have uh, breakfast. You, uh, you know, not to say anything negative about the place, but you do have to be comfortable a little bit with uh, an alleyway atmosphere. By that, I mean this whole area. I used to live in this area, and it's known for a large colony of mice and rats. So even as I was eating, there were mice and rats sort of running around my feet. I didn't get any of it on video, but you, I was sitting there having, a, having my breakfast, and then I'd suddenly see something out of the corner of my eye, some movement, you know, and I kind of look down, and then there's a rat just sort of darting around, and. They, they live in the sewer systems here. There's, there's quite a large number of them. So you'll, you'll more than likely see one or two while you're sitting there having, uh, having your breakfast. So as I said earlier, I haven't had the GoPro out for, for a little while here in uh, Kuala Lumpur. Been laying low for a little bit. And uh, one of the main reasons for that is uh, that I got sick. It's kind of an interesting story, I guess, because over the last, you know, couple of decades or whatever, I, I would generally catch a cold or come down with the flu at least once or twice a year. You know, it's sort of like a regular occurrence. But um, during the, uh, like, three years of the pandemic, I never got sick. You know, all the time that I was in uh, Thailand, in Mesot, I noticed that um, I never got sick, never caught a virus of any kind, and uh, whoa, <laughs> tough street to cross. And uh, I mean, I attributed that to everybody wearing masks. I mean, I was wearing a mask for the entire three years, and uh, most of the people around me were, you know, like 100% of the people around me were wearing masks as well. So there was far less chance of, uh, yeah, getting sick, and I never did. I noticed it. Year after year would pass by, and I'd, I'd remark again, yeah, haven't caught a cold, haven't caught the flu, nothing like that. But here in uh, Kuala Lumpur, of course, there's no longer, you know, it's not a public mask mandate. You don't have to wear a mask outdoors, you know. I'm, in general, I'm not wearing a mask anymore. Maybe the only place you still see it being required is inside the, uh, the transit system. That's about it. So, since I've been in Kuala Lumpur, I've been spending a lot more time out in public, in crowds of people, you know, in markets, all these places, and we're not wearing masks anymore, and caught the flu. Again, I, I really wish I could know exactly when I got it and who I got it from, because of course, someone out there was sick and passed the virus on to me, so I was somehow in proximity to this person who was sick and I got the virus from them. And uh, yeah, it hit pretty hard. Um, the last few years when I catch the flu or something like that, it's actually worse and worse. I mean, in the old days, you know, a cold, you sniffle, you know, blow your nose a lot, and uh, that's about it. You cough a little bit. But 
more and more over the years, I find the flu really does a number on me. And this, the, few, the flu that I got here uh, was the worst I've ever had. So yeah, I was pretty much laid low by this. And it's been about, just about a month since I got it. And I'm still coughing and I still have like a wheezing in my lungs. But I feel better now, I'm outside wandering around a little bit so yeah i'm pretty much recovered but it was the worst flu i've ever had uh just feverish really really weak coughing i mean it, headaches yeah it was like the worst the worst i felt that i that i can ever remember to be honest so i didn't have a lot of energy i couldn't really go outside very much spend most of my time you know in my hotel here and I'm just just now sort of re-emerging uh, and uh, taking a look around at the world once again. So I'm, I'm supposed to already be back in Sumatra because when I came here, I left my bicycle and, and I left it back in the village near Bukatingi where I was staying. And the idea was to return there relatively soon. But yeah, I've been here uh, longer than I expected and the illness has uh, prolonged that but yeah so that's basically uh, what's been going on but i do find the whole idea of the flu quite interesting and uh, so i've had some time to think about that as i said i thought it would be quite interesting to be able to know the exact moment when i encountered this flu virus you know who was the person that i encountered here in kuala lumpur that passed it on to me and where did that person get it from? And where did that person get it from? Like if you, I mean, technically, if you had the technology to do it, you could track this virus from person to person to person to person and track it, you know, back for years and years and years um, in theory, because these viruses, the only way they can survive, sort of as a species, if you can call a virus a species, is by constantly moving on to a new host because my body has finally killed off the virus in my body maybe maybe not entirely but it, my immune system is slowly doing that and it eventually won't be able to live in my body anymore so the only way the virus can survive is if i passed it on to someone else and as it turned out, just before I got sick, a friend of mine from Australia was visiting here, Jason. And I spent a few days with Jason. We were just out you know, playing tourist here in KL. Um, and then he left, he went up to Penang and then he flew to Singapore and back to Australia. And then I got a message from poor Jason saying that uh, by the time he got to Singapore, he became sick. So I had passed the virus on to him I mean, when I was hanging out with him, I didn't know I was uh, sick at the time, not with something like the flu. And um, so, yeah, we were spending a lot of time together and I didn't really know I was coming down with the flu. And I guess I was infectious at that point. I passed it on to him and then maybe in his travels, he passed it on to someone else. And, you know, that virus is just going to keep circulating and circulating and circulating. And it kind of makes you think of this virus, you know, as a living creature and uh you know where did it come from and where is it going next you know i find all that kind of stuff quite interesting and i did a little bit of reading about the flu virus in general and uh, i was kind of surprised to learn that the influenza virus is relatively young i just made the assumption my whole life that the flu has been around for as long as humans have been around. I thought we've just been living with the virus, with the flu virus forever, but it's really not uh, true at all. If I remember right, the earliest written account of a flu virus dates from, I think, 1500 years ago, if I remember right. And, uh, but who knows how reliable that report is. It may not have been the flu at all. I mean, when you really think about influenza, you're really talking about the last 100 
uh, to 200 years when the flu really became a problem for humans. So it's really quite a, quite a new thing. And uh, I was reading a lot about the, um, the epidemic, the pandemic in uh, 1918 to 1919, the big one. And they estimate that within that time period, from 20 to, like the CDC estimates, uh, 50 million people died around the world from what they called the uh, Spanish flu at that time. And I find that interesting from a couple points of view. Again, I was reading on the CDC website, I think it was this morning, where they were, hello, morning. morning. They were uh, writing about the Spanish flu on the website. And in the United States, 675,000 people died from the Spanish flu in 1918, 1919. And that is more deaths than from all the wars of the 20th century combined. So if you put together all the Americans who died in World War I, World War II, the Vietnam War and the Korean War, put those all together, and uh, that's still not as many as died from the flu. And that's pretty crazy because in my lifetime, I tend to think of the flu as, you know, yeah, you cough a little bit and you have some sniffles and in a few days it goes away. I never really thought of it as something that was uh, fatal, that, you know, that's going to kill a lot of people. And you wonder how in the world, you know, you, you, you cough a little bit and you got a runny nose. How is that going to kill you? But when you read about these pandemics, yeah, it can be quite serious. And then when you come down with the flu yourself, like the one that I've had for this past month, yeah, it all starts to make a little bit of sense, um, just how severe it was, uh, the symptoms of it. And if you already have, say, you know, a compromised immune system or you're suffering from some other kind of systemic illness, yeah, I can see how, you know, if you're already weakened a little bit and then the virus gets down into your lungs and you develop pneumonia, your lungs fill with fluid, and yeah, that's how it kills you, apparently. And I can see how it could happen. You know, it could be a very, yeah, it is a fatal disease. Even, even now, I mean, every year, lots and lots of people worldwide die from the flu. You know, it's a regular pandemic every single year, you know, with the flu season. And I don't know how it works here in Asia. I was thinking about that as well. And I haven't done any reading about that, but in Canada, I'm used to the idea that we have a flu season. It comes around once a year and then the medical system in recent decades prepares for it. They anticipate what kind of virus it's going to be and they develop vaccines for it in advance and then they recommend that uh, everybody get a flu shot, but particularly if you're elderly or if you're already ill from something else, that you should get a flu shot to help fight off the flu virus. And we know basically what time of year it's going to come. There's the flu season you know, roughly coincides with the winter, I guess. But here in Asia, I don't know, is there a flu season? Is, is it flu season now, or is it just always here all the time? I, yeah, I really don't know. But anyway, <laughs> that is what has been going on with me, and it's a little bit of what I've been uh, thinking about. And just as a final note, because I imagine some, this will occur to some people. Um, I did wonder in the middle of all this whether it was COVID or not. That was pretty obvious because, as I said, I've never been this sick before in my life. I've, I've never had a flu like this before. So I thought, wow, this is, this is different. There's something weird about this. Um, it's too strong. Uh, I, was way, I was feverish and weak and headaches. And uh, it was, yeah, the worst I've ever felt. So I thought, okay, maybe, you know, this is a COVID. So I did the deep dive into all the symptoms. You know, you diagnose yourself on the internet, convince yourself you have like 20 different diseases by the time you're done. But the way my symptoms stacked up against how they describe COVID symptoms, they didn't match my symptoms and the order in which they appeared, it matched the flu, influenza. It did not match what would happen to you with the COVID virus. Um, and then, I, I, for the first time, I went out and got a COVID uh, test. Um, all this time, I've never had a reason. I was never required 
to uh, get a test done because I, I wasn't traveling during the pandemic at all except for within Thailand a little bit so even after all this time being overseas during the uh, COVID pandemic um, I'd never actually done a test so I had that experience as well I went out here in Kuala Lumpur and bought COVID tests and uh, took me a while to figure them out it was more complicated than I thought, but I eventually got it done and uh, the results came back uh, negative. Boy. I thought all of this was going to be... Uh... I'm back at Masjid Jamek and I thought the whole line had been fixed already, but apparently not. Everything is closed. Got all these uh, buses here blocking the way I'm trying to get across the street it's hard to get through the buses and the cars yeah so I guess some of the uh, transit system is still shut down you have to take all these uh, shuttle buses man <laughs> I'm not uh, <laughs> good <laughs> good timing for that um, <clears throat> I'm not entirely recovered so I still feel a little bit weak and I'm, I'm not really focused so just being out here in the city walking around through that traffic it's just sort of a, a bit much right now I'm not really uh, not feeling that sharp but anyway as I said I uh, tracked down some COVID tests and uh, did them and uh, yeah they all came back negative so that's all good but yeah I still have um, like I said I'm recovered but I still have it here I can feel it in my lungs still it's still down there somehow and it's not really uh, getting out of there so still taking a while but yeah that's it just wanted to uh, give a short update and uh, take you along with my breakfast and hopefully I'll be doing doing a lot more things now that I'm back out in the world and uh, I'll see you then